Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Colpack and Izzo podcast brought to you by Gate City Bank with Jeff Colpack. I'm Dom Izzo. As we wrap up the month of January and a very busy month it has been on the football front, the Bison haven't played a game in six weeks, and so that hasn't stopped the news that has been Never does. pouring out of the Division One football team on the north side of Fargo. A busy week this week with two coaching hires and one coaching departure. I think we have to start with the biggest and then work our way uh, back from that, if that sounds well, okay by I, you. I think we need to start with an apology. As I came in here today, I you slammed broke, the door. Yeah, you broke my studio, man. And, a, and a photo came off the wall and broke. Of you! <laughs> you were in the I picture, I didn't like that one man. anyway. That needed a new one. <laughs> Expense a $6 frame to yes. Walmart out of you uh, in foreign communications. The big story that uh, came... Down the pipe on Wednesday was news that West Fargo's Tyler Roll, longtime offensive coordinator, longtime assistant coach, former player, is leaving and taking the associate head coach and offensive coordinator job at Tennessee State of the Ohio Valley Conference. It's a co-op with the Big South that they get the automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. I can't sit here and say I was surprised, Jeff. We we did the story that morning on Wednesday when we had our Bison Media Zone show on on Extra. I was chatting with Mike about that. Uh, I I was not convinced he was going to be here when the football season began. What I am surprised was about the destination. I asked him that yesterday. I know you talked to him as well. He said, "Just um, I need to get out of my comfort zone." Mm-hmm. Eddie George sought him out. Eddie George is the head coach. At Tennessee State, former Heisman winner, longtime NFL running back in Tennessee with the Titans. Uh, I think that had a, a large part to do with it. And also, I think the, the bitter disappointment of not getting the head coaching job at NDSU. I was surprised zero, honestly. I, I really wasn't. And I've gotten several texts like, were you surprised? I go, absolutely not. Like you said, when he didn't get the job, it was no secret. He was disappointed. I mean, very disappointed. He, and and I guess when you're a competitor and in the business and you yep. think you have as good a shot as anybody and you don't get it, I think the, obviously the, the results are what we see is what happening is what's happening right now. Now, Tennessee State, and, and you alluded to that, interesting destination. Yeah. yeah, Eddie George, I get that. I think he had other opportunities at FBS assistant jobs. It didn't feel right to him for whatever reason. And, and he hasn't been – this is – he hasn't been looking since December. I think it's been two, three years. I mean, he's kept his eye out yep. for other up interviewed at East Tennessee State yep. last year. So that just tell what does that tell you? Tennessee State, though, it's he's gonna find out what life is like in the real world well, of the FCS other half lives, football. Right? Because yeah. the, the let's just look at things like travel. Here you get on a plane generally and fly an hour, hour and a half, two hours wherever you have to go. At Tennessee State, now they will fly here. <laughs> On September seventh, but generally in Ohio Valley, that's a bus league, and the big it's a yeah. bus league, man. Yeah. And and now he's going to have to get on bus trips of six, seven, who knows, eight hours, and that's the way it is. And you're going to have to uh, work and, and, and under those conditions. They don't have a. I think they have some sort of indoor, but they certainly don't have the behemoth that they have out no. here. They sure they don't have the budget. I would imagine of of what NDSU can provide in fall camp to its athletes and, and housing players and, and feeding players and nutrition and a fueling station and having two strength trainers working with the football team like they have this week and, and this winter workout season. The the support staff, yep. Dom, uh, the, the uh, player personnel people, the graduate assistants, the film guys, the, the recruiting assistants. Everything is different. Everything is. Yep. I look at their schedule, by the way. They come here, uh, which I asked him about that. He's like, oh, yeah. My, my, my kids pointed it out to me. I asked him if he ever been in the visiting locker room at the Fargo Dome, which he said he had. But they're at Tennessee Tech. That's across the state. That's in Cookville, so they'll drive there. They go to Lindenwood, Colpack. You've been there. Mm-hmm. When they fly to that, or they drive? Oh, I would imagine it's a drive. <sighs> it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's north of St. Louis and St. Charles. but uh, They go to Macomb. So he's getting back a trip there. Lindenwood, it's like going to and playing at Concordia College. It's about the same size. In fact, I would say Concordia Stadium's bigger than Lindenwood. And by the way, Tennessee State is located in Nashville. 
Um, so they have a trip to Macomb and a trip to Gardner Webb, which you found out that's in North Carolina. You gave us that tidbit when we did our pick 'em you know, good, segment earlier. Good for him, year. Nashville, so, great city. He mentioned that a couple times yep, as well. I yep. know he really likes the city as well. Although I do know a couple people very well in Nashville, and they will tell you that his kids will probably have to go to private school. Mm. Uh, it's not the safest place in the world. In fact, um, I know one guy who knows a, a police officer very well. And said it's it's not it's not a safe place, man. So you, you gotta you gotta know where you're at, and and so and I guess anywhere is dangerous yeah. in America. I yeah. mean, I, I'm not in 2024. To, it is. Yeah. No, no. And, and the cost of living. I mean, yep. uh, trying to find there. a, a five hundred thousand dollar house, man, ain't the same as it is in Fargo. No. Woof. Yep. There was a different way there. I I think all of us. It's the same thing when Entz left. I thought if Entz was going to leave, it wasn't going to be for what he. Did it? Granted, it was at USC. We all assumed it might have been for another head coaching opportunity. Same with Roll. If, if Tyler yeah. was going to leave, I thought it was going to be for an FBS yep. FBS job, and that was not the case. And that that's why that's the surprise angle to me is where it was. Not that he left; it's where he's going. And that I think a lot of people share in that. But Tyler is going to go, and this is an opportunity. Maybe he believe Eddie George is another year left on his contract. I don't know if he's being told he's. The guy in waiting there, I, I mean, he's been told probably, I'm sure, that before. He's been uh, strung out on things like that. So that that why I was surprised was when I saw where, where he was going. Why did Tim Paulsek get this job? He had outside experience yes. outside of Fargo, North Dakota. Yep. He didn't sit here. He no, got he here in 06 and didn't sit here until 2023 and and, and hoped he get this job. Yep. He. Went to Northern Illinois for a year, came back, went to Iowa, Wyoming, and now has the head football position. It makes a difference, people. It does. Yeah. In, in in the football world of coaching and administration, they like to see people and guys and coaches and women and leaders have different feel for how it is done. D- different experiences. In other parts of the mm-hmm. country. Yep. So that's what Tyler's going to go well, get. That's what Matt yep. Matt's flat out told us yep. at his press conference. I was going for yep. other jobs. But the one thing that came back is I didn't have any FBS experience. Yep. So what did he do? Yep. He went to one of the Blue Bloods for FBS. I'll ask you this because I was asked this earlier this week. Do you believe the ship has sailed on Tyler being a future head football coach at North Dakota State? No, he's 38. Absolutely not. Uh, no, it, that certainly has not sailed. Because it has with Vegan. I think that did after Brent didn't get the job when Entz got it oh, Do you think Tyler would want it? I see your that's, saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, way too early to call, uh, but I think Brent wanted it initially. This first time when he yep. when it came open, when Matt Entz got the job, I think he wanted it. Yes, I think by all intents and purposes that he wanted it. I think you can't Paul keep going back it. to the well. I mean, you can't. That's why I think maybe the ship has sailed there as well. I don't know, but it has on Tyler because he hasn't. Uh, I know you didn't get it, but he's an assistant. But now that he's been other places. I think it'd be worth another shot. Yeah, it'd be intrigued to see how this. Uh, plays out. Now, the next big question is, who's going to be the next offensive coordinator? I think that's the really interesting uh, decision that Polisek has to make on who's going to fill that. There are names out there. There are names in the program. Yeah, but I mean, you know, in the systems, the, the pool is so much bigger than the pool of, of being a head coach in the FCS. I mean, Will Johnson being named the cornerbacks coach. Who would We would have you no know. clue. Well, let me ask you this. Does the offensive coordinator have to have a tie like the head coach did? Does the OC have to have a tie to North Dakota State? Or no? I think they have, certainly have to know what NDSU's offense is about. I would say mostly yes, I would think. Okay. You have to know. So the, then that slims that pool up by a heck of a lot then. True. With the way that college football offenses are run, it's not how North Dakota State runs But how do offense. we know who Tim Polisek knows now that he's been Well, he knows a big, couple guys that are on the staff he knows yes, pretty well. But he's been, obviously, the Big Ten in the Mountain West. You, you get to know a lot of coordinators in, in those positions and, and camps. I think yeah. working camps, you get to know people. I would... I would I, I would not narrow the pool just this at this at the instant. I mean, Noel Pauly, you've been you've mentioned I'm, him. I would be I would definitely make a call to Ames to see if he'd be interested Joe in Joe Bashaner is D two coordinator of the yep. year at Minnesota Mankato. Yep. He's called That's what plays. I'm saying he's right there. So is Dan Larson has done it. He did it at Duluth before Noel Pauly got the same job. That's why that's I think Knowing full well what the offense could look like, I think you have to have some understanding of what North Dakota State does offensively. That's why I think that pool might get a little thinner. 
because of what they have the opportunity to do here. When Craig Bull brought in Mike Bresky in 2009 to run the defense yep. and Mike was tinkering with the 3-4, it didn't work out so well, did it? It did not. It was one and done. It, would not, it did not work there. Jason Petrino came in, and mm-hmm. I don't know if he tried to instill different ideas, but uh, it not just, work. Didn't, just didn't seem to work, no. did it? No, and that's why I tend to think offensively-wise that might be something they would go at. Maybe it's on in staff. You're right. Tim knows a ton of people that maybe this is something off the board. We'll get to Will Johnson in a second, but I I would tend to think whoever the next guy is going to be calling would, plays. Would Courtney Messingham come back? That's can another you, name. Can you come back? I think he left on good terms. I don't think that would, would be What do you want to come back, I guess? Is, is needs my a job point. if he wants to keep oh, he's, working. He's hanging in Manhattan, you know? Kansas yeah. right now. I, I, yeah. To my knowledge, he's not employed. I mean, could have a chance to come back here. The offense was pretty darn good when he was calling plays after – Polisic left to take the Iowa gig when I mean I know he, he doesn't here. have Easton Stick, but he has two pretty good He's quarterbacks. Got Cam Miller back, yeah. He's got Cole Payton back in twenty twenty four. That that's the next really interesting decision because the other two open spots have been filled. Uh the safeties coach is going to be led by Devin Kleiman. That is quite the story there. Um I remember vividly interviewing Devin right before the national championship game, before Chris's last uh game, and saying he said to me, I want to be a coach. My grandpa was a coach. My dad's a coach. This is what I want to do. I do want to set out on my own. And as a, ironically as it turns out, Cole Beck, he set out his own in Fargo, North Dakota to, to coach the safeties. I don't know if we have to say it, Dom, but I will say it, that he didn't get the job because his last name's Clark. No. He did not. No. And you were told, and I was told this, that in the interview, he absolutely blasted yeah. it out of yeah. the he, park. He blew him away. I was, I was told, told he was very, very sharp. Yeah. That was the word. So he was very, very sharp. Um, now, it, but it's new. He's out recruiting right now. Yeah. He told me yesterday he was in Lincoln, so he's in the heart of the matter there in Nebraska, which has been a spot where the Bison have have found some home runs. Uh, first time job, and he's entering where he's got an All American back at safety, another guy who played literally every snap in Sam Young this past season. So, I would for each of the secondary coaches, this is a there, there's way more experience with the players than it obviously is with the coaches because at this time last year, it was, it was, it was completely the opposite. The Bison had no experience at that position, which I think, may, I don't know if that makes him feel any better, but the guys have been out there. They've played a ton of football that uh, will be in that spot in 2024. I would think the corners and the D-backs are pretty happy about the hire of Will Johnson. I would think so. This guy's been at Oklahoma two years. He's been at USC two years. He played at cornerback at Oklahoma, so I mean he played high-level and man, FBS Jamar football. Kane just came out with one yep. of the most glowing recommendations I've yep. ever seen in Twitter in a while. And he called him Little Bro, yep. right? And and Jamar Kane said, You'll love Fargo. Yep. I'm I'm paraphrasing. It's my Jamar Kane called it my second home still. He says, Congrats, little bro. You'll love Fargo and working for NDSU football. I hope you know that's my second home, which Jamar has always been pretty vociferous about his love for his time that he spent uh, it's, it's what, three years what here. What role did Matt Ants have in getting hired? I mean, yep. that couldn't hurt. Yep. I, I, I mean, not, Matt, I'm sure they don't know each other that well, yep. but they were at the same school for a, for a few weeks. Yeah, at least for about a month, probably, yeah. that they probably inter, uh, overlap there a bit. But I would imagine Lincoln Riley or some defensive coaches told Matt about what yep. this guy has, and, and Matt relayed the information. I would... Nick Gazer just also uh, tweeted out, can't wait to work with Will. He's going to do a great job in that corner room. Excited to work with this defensive staff. It's time to go to work. Because now it is filled out. That means Grant Olson is going to be the defensive coordinator and the linebackers coach. Jeff Phelps will stay at defensive ends. Gazer is defensive tackle and co-defensive coordinator. Then you have Will Johnson at cornerback and Devin Kleiman at safeties. That's the defensive coaches for 2024. What do we make of that? Well, it seems pretty solid, and again, they have some experience to work with. But uh, this, I some mean, there's, there's newness here. I mean, yes. this is Grant's first time yep. as, as calling, calling call, the defense, calling the defense, yep. and calling the uh, the lineups, and and, and it's got to happen now. You, you're no longer suggesting things; you are making the, the call. Stop in there. I will say for Johnson, he steps into a cornerback room that loses Jaden Price, but you have Jaquise Alexander who started the final seven games of last year. I think Najee Nelson is going to be the starter at the other spot. I really, he the way he came on at the end of last year, I think he's going to be the incumbent. Marcus Shepard is back, and I thought he got better. The transfer in from Bowling Green, um, there's some opportunity there at that spot. There's experience, and also some younger guys that may have a chance to step up and play as well. I think it's a pretty good combination of experience and new coaches. With you know, with 
uh, yeah, you have Devin Kleiman and, and Will Johnson essentially in their first years. Yeah, their fir- these are their first, first full-time position gigs. coaching gigs. Yep. But Grant's been around now. Nick Gazer certainly been around. Jeff Phelps has been, been around everywhere. Yep. So that I mean there's there's a there's a good mix there, and I'll be intrigued so to see how it works. You have, and Randy Hedberg is the quarterbacks coach uh, as of now. I, I would say there's a definite. I would can say is a definite question mark about his status. There, there's nothing been confirmed on that. I will tell you. So that's still up in the air. But how much emphasis then do you put on experience in an offensive coordinator? Do you want somebody who's called plays? Yes, you absolutely do. Absolutely. I, and, I, and this I job do. is yeah, absolutely good enough. I, Where as defensive coordinator, Grant has been around and, and under, yep. understanding, even though he's never done it, you're okay with that. But on the other side, you definitely need somebody who's been in the booth. You're, well, either way, you're going to have two new coordinators Policy is next season. I think you need to have somebody who's call plays either on one side of the ball uh, coming into this season. Hedberg's status, I'm told, is up in the air, and that that's a pretty lock solid source on that. That I would I would tell you that. So I did I he, think did he tell you? <laughs> I would tell you that there was. I don't know if they were paired together, but if Tyler wasn't going to be here, I think there was some consideration that Randy might not be here. And I think now that we know that Tyler's not going to be here, that might be. Enough to assume that. So, I do you need a higher QB coach? They've had that. They've had that as long as I can remember because Vegan held that position. I think Pat Perlis had that position, right, before Vegs got it? I think 100% you have to hire a QB coach. Yeah, the position's way too important not to. Yeah. You, know, you need somebody between and possessions think- to get on the headphones and go, okay, what, what picture did you see there with that protection? And I don't think you can do both, right, QB and OC? I would prefer not. Yeah. No yeah, more. I mean we've seen that in some places, but I don't, I don't know if that's what you want, especially if it's somebody, if you're going external to hire for your offensive coordinator. That to me would be, you probably want to have two different. So there might be a couple hires here left to go. I don't know. That's from where I've been told that that's definitely up in the air for, for 2024. So there's still plenty of <laughs> meat on the bone to chat about for Bison football. There always is. Um, but that's the, a busy week there. On top of the fact that uh, they added two walk-ons uh, out of the state of Minnesota, out of the Twin Cities, one from Egan, one from Mankato that the Bison got, uh, Gage Schmidt and Jack Hansen that uh, have committed to add on to the class of 2024. So we're closing in, you know, signing day is not for another, I think, 10 days for the late signing period. So it they'll have a couple, but it's not necessarily going to be Huge, and I think I said that. So I'll I'll say I was wrong on that. They're mm-hmm. not going to add a lot more to the to the class of 2024. Certainly not transfer wise either. It's not going to happen. And looks like that Tim is not going to dip into the transfer portal like maybe some thought. Yep. Right now, it's just really one just impactful the Fra- guy. Just the Fraley kid is potentially one. impactful, yep. and he he may have a chance to play right away with the uh, the changes that are up front on the on the offensive. But Tim line. told me he said that the transfer portal takes a year in the making. What do you make of that? A year in the making in terms of it, getting a guy on the it, field? Is, is it about evaluation? No, about adding players. Well, I mean, <laughs> I guess it's probably everybody's different opinion on that because, I, I mean, we see teams go and add players and they're playing yeah. right away. So it's probably one's each individual's uh, philosophy it, it, on it's, that. It's, it's, it's a situation where you got to be careful on, on what you do. Right. I mean, you want to take – there's a reason somebody's leaving, right? You always tell me that. There's a reason why somebody is going. If it's playing time, if it's something behind the scenes you don't know, there, that has to get fleshed out. But, I mean, more often than not, you're it's basically plug-and-play now, Colpac, in college football. Guy's leaving. They're going to go, boom, we'll put him in, and he'll play right oh, away Especially the us. quarterbacks. Right. Man, guys commit, then they decommit. They yep. commit, then they go somewhere else. Uh, I want to spend our last little bit here chatting on uh, some basketball. We were at the Bison women's game last night. They beat... St. Thomas handily by 30 points. L. Evans went for career high, 29 points, hit seven of seven from three point range. Bison are now 19 and one in their last 20 games inside the Shield Center. That's something to rave about, considering uh, teams used to go in there and not have any problem beating the Bison. They blow them out. This is not the case. What's happened over the last two years? Now they got their big game. South Dakota State is coming here next Thursday. And I said this on Hot Mike, and I'll say it to you. If Jory Collins wants to get some attention for his program and people really to stand up, you got to beat the Jacks. You have to. And there's not, I don't, 
moral vic no, not even coming within five Colpack or taking an overtime. No. If you want people it's to stand to up, you got to beat them. This and they're win. vulnerable. I understand they're unbeaten, but this is not the heavy hitter SDSU of 2009 or 2019 when they went to the Sweet 16 oh, or even God, last those year. Those teams would come in and pound yeah. the Bison by 40. Right. Just pound you know, them. NDSU's got some some talent to them, and they have some length. I mean, you threw out there last night. You had Coonan at 6'2", Evans at 6'3". Those two, by the way, on that on that zone defense, yeah. those two out front, oh my goodness. Totally changed the game yeah. against Kansas City, by the way, when they had no points or no baskets in the first quarter. You throw Draper out there at 6'2", Simon at 6'2". They've never had that kind of length, not in the Division One era, bar none. And that's why... All right, maybe they can go toe to toe with South Dakota State. We're going to find out. I thought L. Evans was just tremendous. Yeah, against St. Thomas, she's playing at a Conference Player of the Year. I tweeted out the stats of what she's done since she got scoreless against Montana State. I mean, we twenty was twenty five, seventeen, seventeen, twenty two, twenty three, twenty nine. That's her last six games. The three point shot obviously has been really good, and especially lately. But if she could continue to add the drive, because they're going to come out on her. If she could continue to add the drive to the hoops and be strong to the ball to the hoop, um, I would say the word unstoppable would come to it's mind. It's pretty good. I mean, because of how tall and how long she is, she just the made extended over the defender's arms. Nobody's going to get up there and and stop that. And when and if heaven's going, they're an awful. They're they're a fun team to watch. I I'm really intrigued to see what happens. They still have Oral Roberts will come here. South Dakota is going to come here. They already won in Vermilion, but the biggie is is Thursday to see where they're at. I'll give you another reason why I think the Bison are are flowing so well right now. Ten players, yep. they're down to ten, and then also people will go, oh, God, that's. I would argue that when you're down to ten and you have the right ten, there's no room for anybody sulking on the bench because all ten are generally going to play. play of some mm-hmm. sort of role, and certainly in practice and certainly in games. You don't have those 11, 12, 13, 14 players who make like, can make life difficult. I'm not yep. saying they did, yep. but the potential to make life difficult uh, is there yep. and it's real. And in this day and age where parents are investing thousands in their kids to travel the country in AAU ball, they want results, man. Mm. They want them on the floor. In softball, if I were Darren Mueller, I'd want 12, 13 players. Yep. I don't want. Five players out there wondering, pacing the dugout, like, hey, coach, when am I, when am I getting the game? Mm. I don't know if those players are there anymore like you used to. I don't know if people are satisfied to hang just be with the team anymore. I think it's far and few between probably in this day and age where you can leave readily accessible to head of the portal and go. No, I don't think that's probably. Football's a little different because you, know? you just need more bodies you know? and and. I don't think Jory would subscribe to doing 10 all the time, but maybe. I mean, 11. They're, they're allotted 15. He said he's he he'll probably never do fifteen. Yeah, he probably won't. I think probably the max is thirteen, is which they were rolling with to start the season. I'd go with eleven to twelve. Oh, you're still awful because Coonan got a shot up high. You know, if she's out, you now you're down to nine. I mean, you just you, you get any foul trouble, you're in real dire straits there. No, you're walking a fine line. That's what I'm, I'm saying. I I understand your point. I don't. I think thirteen's a good number. I think there's a reason Tops. why men's basketball went to 13 for men's I'd go for scholarships there. You can get through a season of 12. All right. Agree to disagree on that. Uh, Dave Richmond's team lost at St. Thomas uh, last night. This is the only game of the week because of the weird buy uh, structure. Jeez, this team just, it's just yeah. hard to describe. They shot 71% in the first half, 29% in the second half. At St. Thomas and ended up losing the game by yeah, players show up digits. one game they don't show up another you know yep. the consistency is it's just lacking on that team nowhere to be found I would say though at two and four I would not you know throw the season away yet no I'm the not way, saying that the way the league is I mean it's still South Dakota State looks like it is the the top team in the league I don't think there's any arguing that but after that I mean look what Denver did Denver comes here beats the Bison they lose in Grand Forks. Then won in a buzzer beater on Thursday night in double overtime over South Dakota. So I mean, it is roller coaster city is here for the last five weeks of the basketball season. I believe that. I mean, you can. I think you can be a six seed and, and win, win this thing. I really do. So if the Bison even get the six, 
I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility they could do it. That's right, and you can thank the transfer portal for the way things are shaking out <laughs> in the Summit Men this year because guys get good, they leave. Oral yep. Roberts got decimated. Yeah, I mean, they're still pretty good what they have left. Yeah, they're in last place, and they're still pretty no, good. Out of last now, they, they won got last out of nine. But, I mean, they still have McBride, Thompson, and... Yeah, uh, Thompson's like a couple years Weaver. younger than you are. <laughs> I would take all those guys, though. They're really good. And I bet they're still... They get the Jacks tomorrow night in Tulsa. I bet you they win that game. You I would watch ima- that. Again, I would imagine Zeke Mayo leaves after this year. I, I just... You, you, you he get, got, get, he you, got a six-figure offer to leave and got paid five figures to stay in Brookings. So... I kidding. have that on good authority. So, I mean, is that enough for another year? Man, I don't, I don't know. But he is already getting paid pretty well. But again, mm. you you mentioned. I mean, you we. I watched the other night. I'm watching Grant Nelson play for Alabama against Auburn. The other night, I watched Aceman's play for Texas as they played Baylor. I mean, the you look at the last two Summit League first team postseason awards, right? None of them came back the following year. All of them had eligibility to come back. None of them returned for their following season at the school they were at. That's unfortunately what it's become. And that's, I think, also a reason why it's hard to get invested in the men's basketball side of things because there's no consistency year to year of who's going to be here. The Summit League has become minor leagues for the Big Ten, the SEC, and the Big 12. And it's not going anywhere. St. Thomas got ravaged by it. Their best players at Virginia, and yet Johnny Towers got them right at the top of the league. They're four and two. They're a game back of SDSU. So, I mean, they're going to win the league. They're going to win the tournament. If that happens, that is a nuclear meltdown for Josh Fenton and crew. They will not want any part of that because that'll be a national story. Let's no doubt about it. Everybody will be Big talking national about story. it. But. Not even the team they play in the championship game is guaranteed to get the berth. It's the second place team in the league in the regular season standings would get the automatic bid if St. Thomas wins the conference tournament. Or if whoever wins a regular season, if it's not St. Thomas, would go? At, correct. Yes. If the regular season champion is not St. Thomas. And St. Thomas wins yeah, the tournament. Correct. They would get the automatic bid. So you could have the real potential on a Tuesday night in Sioux Falls that Neither of the teams that are playing in the championship game go to the tournament. That is not a good sign for your league. Oh, you do God. not. But I will point this out. This happened last year. Everybody's Cinderella. Fairly Dickinson. The only reason they got in the tournament is because Merrimack won their league, but they're going through the transition as well. So that's how Fairly FDU got in. And then, of course, they beat Purdue, and the rest is history after that. So who knows? We might have the same story cooking up this March uh, in the Summit League. But. We'll find out. So, you know what the best thing you're going to read today? What's that? My column on girls wrestling in oh, Fargo. Listen to you, your column on <laughs> girls wrestling. Yeah. Pioneers, man. Why is it so good? Tell us about it. Why is it so good? It, it, it's it's these girls who, uh, with Tony Fugelberg as a head coach, and I'll make this short and sweet. That here's this guy. It's a second year, and it's all it's, it's kids from all schools in Fargo. And he's making a difference. There's 23 girls on the team. He's making such a difference in their lives. These are girls who probably wouldn't be doing anything in the in the winter. And one girl told me I'd probably be sitting home watching TV and and maybe getting in a you know not mm. I, I I I want it's the discipline that the sport has given these girls and the confidence it's given these girls. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had three four years ago. I would say I've seen this up close. Jamestown was the first that brought women's wrestling to North Dakota, that was back in 2008, that this sport is huge. When the state sanctioned it, North Dakota was one of the first to get on board to make girls wrestling a state-sanctioned sport. You can make the argument, Dom, that girls are helping save the sport. Mm. NDSU will will be in discussions to get a program at some point. Not this year, but it won't be long. Really? If you had women's wrestling up there, that would be a smart move. Yep, That would definitely be... Uh, the way to go, but it, they, I know they know about it. Yeah. I mean, I know it's it, it, it it's been discussed on what to do when it when time comes between women's wrestling or girls wrestling and softball, the two biggest sports in high school in North Dakota, the ones that are just going straight up, and it's only gonna only gonna get bigger from this. So check it out; it's a good story that Colt Pack wrote. You can check it out at Inforum. Com. That'll wrap up this week's show. If you missed any of our previous shows, you can download them, listen to them at Apple iTunes, Google Play, of course, Inforum.com is our complete library 
of shows that we've done uh, heck for the past whatever five ten years they're all there you ever gone back and listened to any of them I don't know no, I haven't. Not, not once? I, I, I'm a shark, Dom. I keep going forward. See, there's a couple. Can't look back. <laughs> there's a couple. I, I encourage you to go back. Some predictions Which ones? there. Uh, I'll, I'll oh, tell the you ones where I look like a fool? Not just you, everybody, boy. Both of us look pretty good. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Colt Beck and Izzo Podcast at Inforum.com.